Exposing an ostrich's leg muscles, vet Dr. Jan Forster shows Curry the closest thing to a tyrannosaur's leg he's likely to see. The amazing thing to me is just that, um, you know, when you look at these joints, they really aren't different at all from the dinosaurs. These animals have the bulk of the muscles concentrated up top. And once you get into the lower part of the leg, everything is run by tendons and ligaments, and they give it a certain amount of spring. So, so for you, how, how did this sort of research inform your ongoing theory of, about Dunnigan? What did you take away from this? I've, I've been very interested, of course, in uh, changes in dinosaurs as they grow up. Uh, but I wasn't really prepared for what we saw when we found the first small tyrannosaurs. And we still don't have babies. We still don't have ones that are small enough to, to have just hatched out of eggs. We're still looking for those kind of things. But even the, uh, the very young ones, the, uh, the two-year-olds, uh, as we found out since, um, are animals that look very, very different than the adults. Uh, it'd be very easy for us to misidentify them, not as tyrannosaurs, but as a new species of small theropod because of their build. So for example, when we look at the relative proportions of a small tyrannosaur, they're not different at all from the proportions we see in the ostrich mimic dinosaurs. When we uh, make those comparisons, it, it, it's a little bit shocking actually. To, to realize that uh, baby tyrannosaurs could be that different than the adults. And, and that got me thinking about a lot of things because um, not only would they be uh, in all probability faster than the adults, but they were certainly a lot more maneuverable than the adults. Now we decided, or well, the team decided next to go to see the Komodo dragon and you'll see why in a minute. On the island of Rinka in the Komodo National Park, the Komodo dragon is the undisputed apex predator. What might these giant lizards tell Dr. Curry about how tyrannosaurs fed themselves 65 million years ago? When Dr. Curry finally comes face to face with the killer lizards, they're moving in on a potential prey. He must tread carefully as the dragons are quick to attack and highly dangerous. So, so tell us what came out of that, because obviously some people will be saying, you know, is, you know where are the similarities? What, you know, so tell us what your takeaways were from that. Uh, I had several takeaways. Uh, part of it was anatomical in terms of the teeth. Uh, tyrannosaurs have enormous teeth, uh, much bigger than what we see in Komodo dragons in terms of the relative size to their bodies. And uh, Komodos uh, also have those teeth, though, deeply embedded in the gums. So really, you only see the t tips of the teeth. And there's a reason for that, as it turns out, that uh, Komodo dragons actually have poison glands. And uh, when they bite their prey, uh, the gums are compressed and squeezes poison out of the lower jaw glands, actually, uh, which get in, into the, the wounds. Now, I'm not saying tyrannosaurs did that, but one thing we've noticed with tyrannosaurs, too, is that tyrannosaurs have teeth that uh, pr pr protrude far above the edge of the jaw. And uh, it's quite evident that they also had very thick gums. Now, behaviorally, what was incredible to me was the fact that those nine dragons that uh, um, ate that wild boar, they ate that wild boar in 18 minutes flat. It was completely gone, and uh, as it said, there was nothing left. We didn't even see blood on the ground. Um, it was completely gone. And we're talking about uh, an animal that uh, was as large compared to its prey as a tyrannosaur would be compared to its prey, and yet it had relatively small teeth compared to what we see in tyrannosaurs. And then the final thing that I, I took away from this is that uh, Komodo dragons um, aren't, of course, known for their social behavior. In fact, they're supposed to be quite aggressive towards each other. But during that feeding frenzy, uh, they didn't attack each other. They, in fact, cooperated with each other to pull the prey apart. Uh, there was no fighting. That, uh, and what you ended up with was a very efficient system that um, basically got rid of that animal very, very quickly and disposed of it. Now, one of the other really interesting areas that the film goes into, and obviously following Phil's research, is for, for Phil's dinosaurs, as it were, to do what he thought it might do, we needed to look inside the brain uh, and understand how the brain worked. And this next clip 
amazingly starts to look at that whole area. At Ohio University, Dr. Phil Curry and Dr. Larry Whitmer are putting the skull of a 70 million year old Tyrannosaurus through a CT scan. As the scan probes the skull's nooks and crannies, the long extinct animal appears to come alive. Now Dr. Curry begins to see the final proof of his pack hunting theory take shape before his eyes. That must be quite interesting research to do because you're now suddenly, I mean, did you think it was going to be possible to, to do everything you did there? Uh, for a long time, of course, what we have been able to do is, is yeah. take a skull and cut it in, in pieces and, and look at the size of the brain. So uh, we've, we've uh, been able to do this uh, in a very primitive way for a long time. This isn't uh, new in terms of what the size of the brain is. What is new is the technology that is used to actually analyze it. And uh, it, it uh, basically allows us to take a good skull, run it through a CAT scanner, and get all the information out of it without destroying the fossil itself. Yeah. For you, in a way, th and this moment in the film, everything's so starting to sort of come together, isn't it? And, and you know, all the, your, all the pieces. Just, so just, just piece together for the audience here very broadly. I mean, obviously, you know, theories don't begin and end just because a film begins and ends. They go on and the research continues. But as a snapshot of your, your conclusion in the film, just to give them a flavor of how all the research we've seen leads to some conclusion. The amazing thing is we are just looking at a snapshot in time and we're talking about uh, very specific dinosaurs. We're talking about uh, Albertosaurus, a uh, small relative of Tyrannosaurus rex. We're talking about Tarbosaurus. We're not talking about Tyrannosaurus rex itself necessarily because um, we only have one site where we have multiple specimens of that animal there. Now, uh, people sometimes jump to conclusions that uh, if you've shown that behavior is possible for one animal, that it must be like that for all of them. But it's not that way. Uh, all you have to do is think of the modern world again, lions and tigers. Uh, they're animals that are very closely related to each other. It's very hard to tell a lion skeleton from a tiger skeleton once you take the flesh off the outside of it. And yet they're animals that have very different behaviors as well. Um, these behaviors, in part, I think, are, are always there as a potential for these animals, but uh, it depends very much on what environments they live in, what kinds of prey they're going after, and so on and so on. So uh, the same applies to tyrannosaurs and to other carnivorous dinosaurs as well. Some species may have been pack hunters, other species may have been solitary, more or less like our old image of all carnivorous dinosaurs. There's always uh, qualifiers on this in science. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, tyrannosaurs, okay, they had relatively big brains, uh, certainly big brains compared to the prey that they were hunting. But um, nevertheless, compared to us, their brains really aren't that big. And yet uh, we also know that uh, in some cases, sophisticated behavior, such as we see in uh, fish and insects and, and many animals today, don't necessarily require big brains. So uh, in some cases, what we have to do is, is reassess what we mean by intelligence and adaptability and, um, you know, exactly what behavior uh, can be linked to the brain. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done on this. And it sort of, in a general way, changes our image that we might have been if we had lived then, wandering around, found one of these great creatures was, was hunting us, but in fact, turned around and found there was a whole group behind us, which would have been pretty damn scary, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, I would have hate to have been chased by that uh, pack of Albertosaurus, which included uh, animals as big as me, right through to full animals mm. of, of four tons mm. or more. Mm. And uh, all of them would have been uh, certainly much more powerful, and uh, some of the small ones would have been much faster than me. We may, we may need to get Steven Spielberg to, to revise Jurassic Park. Exactly. <laughs>